All righty, welcome to Enriched Air Nitrox. My name is Benjamin Hadfield. I'll be teaching your class this evening. My qualification to teach us. I'm a master instructor with SSI. Um, I'm a course director with um, uh, SDI TDI. Um, I'm also certified to teach advanced nitrox as well as nitrox through both those, those organizations, um, which means I can teach um, level one, level two, and all the way up to 100% nitrox. So as you got, Justin, as you kind of go through this course, uh, one of the things in, and your courses, I always encourage the same thing. And, I, and I, as you look at this, uh, these specialties, I've, I've put in um, highlight the uh, or uh, bold, the ones that I always suggest for every student. I think those are good ones. But think about where you want to go with your diving journey and what that looks like to you. So as you start thinking about that diving journey, you might find that ice diving and dry suit diving may not be for you, but maybe they are. Uh, maybe professional diving, um, going to dive guide uh, would be a good way to go. And so we can take you there. Um, and if you're going to be a dive guide, I always encourage independent or solo diving as well. Um, it definitely makes for better divers as well. So uh, if you want to go into search and recovery, uh, search and rescue, search and recovery is a great one. Um, if you just want to understand pretty fish, there's all kinds of cool stuff there. So think about it as you got to go through your journey. What does that look like and where do you want it to take you? Um Sadistic classes that go really nicely with this, uh, deep diving and night limited viz, but also stress and rescue um, with the O2 provider, CPR, AED, and first aid are a good companion to this course as well. It makes you just a safer diver. So that's kind of where we go. So as we kind of go through this, one of the things I'd like to start with is what is nitrox? Justin, what is nitrox to you? Nitrox is... Uh... Well, technically, any any mixture of, of gas that contains oxygen, breathing gas that contains oxygen, would be nitrox. But pretty much anything over atmospheric levels, so anything above twenty one percent, to me, that's nitrox. Absolutely, and that's the definition by SSI standards. But you're right; the definition of nitrox is any blend of oxygen and nitrogen together. That's nitrox. But for diving purposes, we'll con uh, consult uh, consider that to be any blend higher than 21% is going to be uh, nitrox. So what is the composition of the air that we breathe, Justin? <laughs> composition of the atmosphere that we breathe is primarily, uh, there's a few other gases in there, but but in the diving community, we round it off to 79% uh, nitrogen, 21% oxygen. Absolutely. That's exactly correct. So tonight we're going to be talking about level one and level two levels of nitrox. And level one is going to be your 32%. Level two is going to be 30%, uh, 36%, but up to 40% nitrox. Uh, so what's what we're going to be dealing with this evening. Um, so what are some of the advantages, Justin, to using uh, nitrox? Uh, the advantages to using nitrox is, is uh, a uh, longer bottom time with lower decompression. Uh, you can also, if you use standard tables, um, you can uh, dive to, uh, you have, a, it just simply increases your safety margins. Uh, if you use standard tables without exceeding, no de without exceeding your uh, um, recreational depths. Gotcha. So yeah, the, so the easiest way to put it, uh, the advantages of nitrox is if you want to dive longer, um, have more bottom time, for example, um, have shorter surface intervals and more energy after a dive, then nitrox is for you. And while the last is certainly a debatable uh, question, I can tell you from personal experience, it absolutely is. And that being because auction has a slight narcotic effect. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so just kind of something to be aware of. Now, what are some of the limitations to nitrox, Justin? Depth. Oxygen yeah. toxicity. Absolutely. So this is going to be a nice, easy class. You're going to make my job nice and simple. So overall, as we kind of work with nitrox, Justin, the thing to understand about um, diving is the partial pressure of nitrogen is really, uh, and nitrogen are our precluding factor as we go through this. And so understanding, first off, what happens with partial pressures is definitely a key. Um, to working through this. So I'm going to bring myself back up on the screen. The way I like to explain it is with one of our kitchen sponges that I stole from the uh, kitchen and I cut up into little squares and it's kind of perfect, right? As we look at this, uh, we have the darker blue, which is 
about 21%, and the, and the lighter blue is about 79%. And so we could say that this was equal to one cubic inch of air. Fair enough? Yeah. Now, that would be at the surface. Now, the thing about it is, is when we go down to the depth of 33 feet, which is one atmosphere, or I'm sorry, two atmospheres, um, we're going to have a compression. What ends up happening is the size of the molecules don't change. What does change is the amount of space between them. So much like a sponge, it would be compressed and we would have two cubic inches of air, the side of the space, same space as one cubic inch of air. So as we look at it, we would consider that to be more like having 42% oxygen and 158% nitrogen. That's what we're breathing in because it's been compact because the space between the molecules has decreased. As we go down to 66 feet, all of a sudden now we're squeezing all that extra space out and we now have the equivalent of three molecules of gas in the same amount of space. And because it's more dense, um, it's able to get into our tissue compartments more easily and a more dense as well. As we start coming up in the water column, um, we know that there's going to be an expansion. And as we expand, that creates what, Justin? That creates problems if you have uh, if you have exceeded, if you've saturated your tissues. Well, not so much. I mean, we, it's going to, it, it depends on how fast you come up and, and whatnot. But as these expand, it's going to create bubbles. Yeah. And we, we first start off with silent bubbles. Okay, and we work our way up uh, from there. And as they, the bubbles become larger, they start with bubble, they start as bubble seeds. They're the very smallest mm -hmm. form of bubbles we can possibly deal with. And that's not a problem. Then they become silent bubbles. And as, they, as those bubbles come out and become larger, if we uh, don't take care um, to come up slowly enough, use safety stops, use decompression stops, those bubbles can actually perfuse to get uh, together and grow to the point where they become symptomatic and problematic bubbles. Okay. And as they grow into that, that, that larger size, they get trapped in places. They get trapped in the, in the bloodstream. They get trapped in the joints. They, they can cause all manner of problems. And that's where DCS comes from is it, um, as they expand. So as we realize um, that's what's going on and that's kind of what we're dealing with. Now, the advantage as we kind of look at nitrox is we are literally taking in less nitrogen. So if mm -hmm. we are doing uh, two bar, which is 33 feet, eight, um, uh, 33 feet um, in uh, diving, we've got 1.58 or 158% nitrogen and 42% oxygen. But if we were to breathe 32% nit uh, nitrox, which at the surface is 32% oxygen and 68%, so literally we're 11% less nitrogen. Simple mm -hmm. enough, when we go down to... 33 feet, that 11% nitrogen reduction now becomes 22% reduction. So yeah. simple enough, the way I like to think about it is the easiest way to avoid a hangover is not to drink beer or yeah. alcohol, right? So the, uh, or if you do our proclivity uh, is to drink, certainly if you drink less the night before, you have less hangover the day after, right? Yeah. Well, simple enough. Uh, so as we work on this, so if in the uh, process of using nitrox, if we breathe less nitrogen, we, in theory, have less problems with nitrogen bubbles because we have less nitrogen, right? Yep. Easy enough. So that's what we're dealing with. So kind of a couple, a little bit of housekeeping, just kind of understand how oxygen, hyperoxicity and hyperoxic, um, uh, nature's uh, hypoxic and hyperoxic uh, uh, situations affect the human body. We're breathing 21%, which is right here, dead center. That's the normal partial pressure of air that um, we're breathing right now. Now, the bad things happen if we start going hypoxic, which means we reduce the partial pressure of oxygen. Now, at 0.16, that's the level where oxygen uh, becomes hypoxic. And the tolerance for working out and mental uh, acuity and, and uh, coordination starts to diminish. Yep. At 0.12 is the minimum level to remain conscious. And at 0.10 is the uh, level at which you die. Uh, that's the that 0.10 is the level at which um, you need to at least above that to sustain life. Now, yeah. we start once you go below that, once you go below that, you, you, you're, uh, you're done. 
Absolutely. Yeah. You die. And that's dying's bad. Um, yeah. So as we go through this, as we start getting to hyperoxic at 1.1, that's a threshold where oxygen toxicity symptoms can begin to present. Yeah. At 1.4 is the level that presents a moderate risk and it's the recommended partial pressure limit for recreational divers. Now, Justin, I want you to um, you know, tattoo this on your forehead if you need, on t- t- uh, on your wrist if, you, if you'd like, but 1.4 and 1.6 are two magical numbers that you're going to see a lot, especially when it comes to diving. Yep. And so we always want to make sure that we keep our partial pressure oxygen at that 1.4 or less. Now, yep. as we looked at earlier um, in the previous slide, we kind of got an idea that that could happen fairly quickly at 30. If we're breathing, for example, 32% nitrogen or nitrox, I mean, at 33 feet, we've gone from 0.42 to 0.64 in just 33 feet. And as you might guess, if we were to go to 66 feet, what would the partial pressure of oxygen be at 66 feet? At 66 feet, you're adding another 32, uh, another 0.32. So that would be, um, that would be uh, 0.96. That's exactly right. Now, remember we just talked about a minute ago, we're at 66 feet on 32% and we're at 0. 0.96. 1.1 is the threshold where symptoms could occur. See how quickly we're getting towards there? Yep. Now at 99 feet on that same dynamic, so if, we, if we're at 33 feet and we're at 0. 0.64, at 66 feet, we're 0. 0.96. What are we at 99 feet? At 99 feet, we would be... Uh, 0.96, another 32. Uh, so that would be um, eight, another three to the nine. Uh, we would be at uh, 12. Uh, we would be at 1.28. That's exactly right. See how quickly we got there? It didn't take much yep. for us to get, we're at one point. Uh, to eight and our, our limit is 1.4. So now you can see really quickly where that limit starts to come into play, right? Now yep. uh, be aware that at 1.6, that is the absolute partial pressure limit for di- recreational divers. End of statement, bet bar none, do not pass go. Um, yep. Do not do that because you will not be able to get to go. You'll, you die, right? Yep. Um, and, it's, and well, it's, that's an over-exaggeration. It's certainly not far from the truth as well. So just be aware yeah. Um, as we look through this, it might be a test question of 0.10 to, to remain to uh, sustain life, 0.10 to remain conscious. Yep. So, the 0.12, sorry. So, some of the benefits of you breathing less nitrogen are pretty straightforward. Nitrox uh, use of bottom time. So, nitrogen, um, nitrox and nitrocosis is kind of the first idea. Now, while it's not been proven, this is absolutely true, that using nitrox reduces nitrogen narcosis, it is viable and, and common sense to say that if I breathe less nitrogen, I would have less chances of getting nitrogen narcosis. The same way my beer analogy, if or if uh, donuts is another great one. If I eat less donuts, I get less fat. It's yeah. pretty straightforward, right? So it's 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 certainly um simple to say that if I breathe less nitrogen that I get less nitrogen narcosis. Uh, nitrogen use and decompression sickness is another good one as well. Nitro, uh, decompression sickness is uh, directly tied and directly related to nitrogen bubbles ex, ex, um, exiting or diffusing out of the tissue compartments into the bloodstream, into the venous system to be exhaled through the alveolar in our lungs and, and, and through our exhaust, right? So yep. if we have less nitrogen in our system, the good news is, is less bubbles, right? Same thing, donuts um, re- mean less fat, right? Yes. So if we have nitrogen, uh, uh, nit- nitrox, we have less chance of getting decompression sickness. Now, there is a sacrifice of nit- uh, nitrox safety margin. Uh, so the question becomes, is richer always better? Richer's not, richer is not always better. 
Absolutely. I've met some rich guys that are complete jerks and, <laughs> and I'd like to knock their block off. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so in every sense, richer is not always better, right? Happiness is always what we want, but it, everything in moderation. So one of the things you can do, and I see this fairly, uh, fairly regularly, especially in um, newer divers that are a little less sure of themselves, they'll sacrifice the nit nitrox safety margin. And what they'll do mm -hmm. is they'll dive nitrox on an air table. Yeah. Now, it's pretty simple to see what would happen if you did that. If I'm diving at two at 33 feet on nitrox or on air, I've got 42, uh, 158% nitrogen uh, coming through my system. If I yeah. do that same dive, I've got 22% less nitrogen, which if you think about it, that gives me a 22% safety margin. Simple enough. Now, yeah. me, myself, and I, I, I would rather know exactly where I'm at. So I always program it into my nitrox programmable computer. Absolutely. Um, so, that, so that I have a, an accurate picture of exactly where I'm at. And I can set my conservativeness based on that. I don't need to. Yeah. I've never been that guy that needed to set the clock 15 minutes fast, faster than what it actually is, so I can make it to my meetings on time. I want oh, to know. What yeah, in my, it personal, is. in my personal experience is if you know that the clock is 15 minutes fast, you'll take an extra, you'll burn an extra 15 minutes on that clock and you're just as late. <laughs> absolutely. So um, certainly people do that. And that is one of the things that you can absolutely do. Now we're going to go through the kind of the, the rough section. And I promise you uh, at the end of this, I'm going to give you some easy ways to do this. So simple enough, we need to talk a little bit about Henry's law and Dalton's law. Uh, Henry's law is the amount of dissolved gas will dissolve in a liquid is directly proportioned with the partial pressure of that gas. And given um, that the temperature and the molecular movement, the agitation of that liquid are constant, that also has to do with temperature as well, that um, all at a constant temperature, it's not uh, put in that. Now, uh, the chemist, William Henry, he figured this out in the late 1800s. He's a pretty smart guy when it came down to it. So what he's really telling you is, uh, I like to call this the Kool-Aid law. Now, Justin, if, if I had a big glass pitcher of water and I poured a packet of Kool-Aid um, crystals into it and I didn't do anything, how fast would they dissolve? If you didn't do anything to it, they would take quite a while to dissolve. Absolutely. What if I stuck my wooden spoon in there and I stirred the crap out of it? Would it stir up pretty quick? It would dissolve a lot faster. Absolutely. So that's what we're saying is the agitation is your heart. The liquid is the blood. So as I breathe in, if my heart is beating faster, the nitrogen and that gas, partial pressure of nitrogen will dissolve into the bloodstream more quickly and, and go out to my tissue compartments. Now, interesting yep. enough, it also has to do with temperature. So if it is cold, that that uh, gas will actually dissolve more quickly into the bloodstream and, and absorb into the tissue compartments more readily as well. That makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of interesting if you look at it. Thick, the it blood is. is thicker and can contain more gas. Absolutely. So it um, Or the gas is more dense and it gets into smaller places. Yeah. So Possibly both are true. So every time you see Henry's Law, I just want you to think Kool-Aid Law. That's really what we're trying to tell you. Now, Dalton's Law is really basic. And he talks about the fact that the amount of gas that will... Dissolve the liquid is directly proportioned to the partial pressure of that gas, given that the temperature of the molecule movement, agitation of the liquid are constant. All we're all Dalton is really trying to tell you here very complexly is that one plus one equals two. That everything's going to be proportionate. So if yeah. I'm at the surface and I'm at one atmosphere, everything has to add up to one. So if I've got gases, a certain percent, uh, percentage of that, like, for example, nitrogen, is going to be 79% of it. That means that 21% of it is going to be oxygen, equaling one whole part or 100%. When I go down to two atmospheres, now everything has to add up to 200%, which means that I'm going to have to deal with 158% nitrogen and 42% oxygen to make 200%. That's all he's trying to tell you. He's uh, all these laws are extremely complicated in what, um, they, in what they do, but as they go through it, Dalton's Law really is the calculation that we use for nitrox calculations for best blends as well as uh, mod, our max operating depths. So that's all they're really trying to tell you. 
So Dalton's law and partial practice. I hope you have some paper because you're going to need it. Um, let's just get some, a few basic um, things out of the way first. We're saying surface partial pressure at one atmosphere is 0.21 or 21%. Nitrogen is 0.79 or 79%. 33 feet seawater, FSW, is two atmospheres. The air that we breathe at two atmospheres is 0.21 uh, times two equals 42. That's all we're yeah. trying to do. Two atmospheres. Three atmospheres is 0.21 times three equals 66. Make sense? Yeah. So that's all we're saying. Now, the part they never talk about in nitrox class is the nitrogen side. And nitrogen side is actually just as important. So nitrogen, yeah. two atmospheres, 0.79 is going to be 158%. So a quick, couple quick safety notes. Oxygen becomes toxic at 1.6. So the working load for oxygen for safety is 1.4. Yeah. Now, let's talk about the other side of that coin, though, that we don't ever talk about. Nitrogen becomes narcotic at 2.37. 2 2.37. Gotcha. Or how many feet? 66 feet, right? Yeah. Nitrogen becomes unsafe at 3.95. And here's how you look at it for nitrogen narcosis. Nitrogen will become equal to one martini on an empty stomach at 100 feet and increase exponentially thereafter. So interestingly enough, at 66 feet on air, nitrogen uh, becomes starts to become narcotic. But let's get into this just a little deeper. So Dalton's Law and Best Practice. Now, uh, Justin, do you happen to have your MySSI app handy? Yes, I do. Perfect. If you wouldn't mind, open that up. Go to the lower right-hand corner where it says more and let me know yep. when you're there. Uh, uh, I'm actually already in the uh, tables. Perfect. So once you're down to the tables, you want to go to best mix. And you want to open that up in Imperial, not metric, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> Let's see. Best mix. Best gas mix tables. Yep. English Imperial. There you go. It always defaults to metric no matter what you do. So make sure you take a look at that. Now, it may look just like the table I have here on the screen. Does it look similar? Similar? Yep. Looks identical. Should look identical, right? So here's yep. how we do this. Here's the math behind that. 1.4 working load ATA is actually what we're trying to get to. So what we do is we divide the depth by 33. That gives us our atmosphere. 1.4 working load ATA divided by the actual atmosphere equals our best mix. So where would, where would we use this, Justin? Here's an example. If a diver like myself wanted to make a dive to 115 feet because I knew I was diving the Lady Luck in, in Orlando, or not Orlando, yeah. uh, Miami, um, I, would, I could call my dive shop and I could say, hey, I want to order best mix for the dive because I know I'm going to be at 110 feet. Um, and uh, so I'm going to go ahead and order for 115 feet to make sure that I'm safe. So here's how I do it. I do 115 feet, which is the depth, divided by 33 feet seawater. And that gives me 3.48. Now, Dustin, Justin, I'm going to add one because I need to add the surface atmosphere to addition to that, giving me a total atmospheric uh, pressure of 4.48. With me so far? Um, yeah. So simple enough, I'm dividing the depth by the by my atmospheres, which is 33. Yeah. And then I just add add one. That's all I'm doing. You always yeah. got to remember, 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 remember. You're going to either add or subtract one for every atmospheric calculation. Yeah. Okay. So once I get that 4.48, all I need to do is divide 1.4, which is the working load that I want to go to, by that 4.48. And I come up with a magic number of 31%. Now let's check ourselves, Justin. Uh so I wanted to go to 115 feet. What does it say on the chart? Uh, 115 feet, it says 31. Exactly. That's how it's going to help you. Now, Justin, how will this affect your nitrogen exposure? Well, by taking by breathing 31% oxygen, you are uh, breathing less nitrogen. Exactly. So I um, potentially should be able to increase my bottom time by that shouldn't i yeah as well as my safety margin yeah all right so hopefully you got your pencil and paper ready because we got a question for you so justin if i wanted to a dive to 100 feet okay 
what is the best blend for me for 100 feet? Here's the math. Okay, so for 100 feet, I'm just going to automatically add in the 33 to kind of shorten it for myself, uh, the extra atmosphere. Um, so then I am going to divide that by 33. So that is... What did you come up with? I came up with 0. 0.4. So let's go ahead and do it together. So if I took, let's just do it by order of operations of what you see on the screen. So okay. 100 feet is my dive. So 100 divided by 33 feet equals what? Three point, three point something. Three point oh three. Three point oh three. Okay. So now we just add that one for the surface atmosphere. So plus one equals what? Okay. So am I adding thirty three feet as a plus one, or am I adding? Nope. Just plus can, one. You see, can you see the screen? I got gotcha. you. Okay. One hundred divided by thirty three. One hundred. 100 divided by 33 uh, would be the three. So that's 99. Uh, subtract. I've got one. And you can absolutely okay. use your calculator. So it should so 100 divided by 33 should be 3.03, .03, right? Yeah, 3.03. .03. E easy enough. So there's the, you look at your screen and that's that uh, question mark right there. So that's the question mark is now 3.03. .03. So now we add 3.03 .03 plus one equals 4.03, right? Plus one. Yep. So 3.03 .03 plus, plus one is 0.4. Or 4.03. Exactly. So. There you go. Easy enough. So now that we've got that 4.03, all you got to do is take that 4.03 and divide it by 1.4. And then divide by 1.4. Which brings us to 3.744. Should come up with 0.34 is what you're looking for. So 1.4 divided by okay. 4.03 equals. Uh, 
Okay, let me work the problem again real quick. Divided by 33 equals you know, plus one. Divide by 1.4. So do it just like it's on the screen. 1.4 divided by 4.03 equals? Maybe my calculator don't like this. 100 divided by 33. That's 3.03 uh, pull equals plus 1 is 4.03. Now take 1.4 divided by 4.03. 1.4 divided by 4.03. Okay, that's, I'm doing it reverse. Okay. Can you so, see my screen? Yeah, I got so, you. Okay. So, 1.4 divided by 4.03. That is 0.34. There you go. 34% is your magic number. Now, the good news nice. is, Justin, is you can always go back to this chart. It's all, everything is here, but that's how you do the math. The math is really not that complicated. Um, I don't ever use a chart because I do the math um, every single time. It's just easier for me. Yeah, I was just getting a little mixed up in my order of operations. Absolutely. It happens. Not a big deal. Okay, so let's go to, so there's two parts of this. And this, is, this is the same math equation, but now we're just figuring something different out. Now, Dalton's all practical application. We also need to be able to figure out our maximum operating depth. So if I go onto a dive boat, Justin, and they hand me a bottle of 34% nitrox. I need to be able to figure out what the uh, maximum operating depth is. Make sense? Yeah. So for example, if they handed me a bottle of 40%, I could go to this chart very quickly and I could tell you that 1.4, my maximum depth is going to be 83 feet. Yeah. So all we're doing is the same math equation, but we're just putting it in a different order. So the math equation to figure that out is 1.4 divided by the gas, 40%, equals 3.5. Now remember, we either have to always subtract or add the surface atmospheric pressure. So in this particular case, I'm subtracting one from 3.5, giving me 2.5. So all I need to do is say 2.5 times 33 feet equals 82 and a half feet. That's all there is to do the math on this. Okay. Easy enough, but you can also go to those charts if you would. Um, go to your charts real quick again on your Maya app. Yeah. And there's one for maximum operating depth. Maximum operating. Maximum operating depth. And if it were me, before I went on an indie dive trip, um, and I were you, I would make a screenshot of both these charts and have them as a photo in case I didn't have internet coverage. I'm looking for the uh, there's maximum operating depth. Gotcha. Easy Period. enough. Yeah. Gotcha. Simple. Simple enough. Makes sense. Yes, sir. All right. That's pretty basic stuff when it comes down to it. But the nice thing is, is there are some nice easy uh, charts to to make your life uh, easier to deal with. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the dangers of oxygen in the diver. So there's a couple different things we talk about, hypoxia or anioxia. Uh, uh, hypoxia, low oxygen, uh, the types of hypoxia, symptoms of hypoxia, prevention, um, oxygen toxicity, CNS toxicity, um, and those two are different things. There's pulmonary oxygen toxicity and mm -hmm. there's central nervous system toxicity. And we're yeah. going to talk about some of the tolerances as well as the etiology of the toxicity itself. So as we got to go through this, the first thing to be aware of is central nervous system or oxygen toxicity. 
The symptoms of central nervous system oxygen toxicity are pretty straightforward. They all happen with the cerebral network. So it's pretty straightforward as we start dealing with that. But let's kind of back up a little bit. Um, oxygen toxicity, when you start talking pulmonary, is the first thing that might happen. And it's interesting enough, Dr. J. Lorraine Smith first discussed this and described the, the issues with oxygen toxicity in 1899. And he actually worked with Paul Burt, um, and he, they were some of the ones that helped come up with the dive tables and understanding what was going on with DCS. Um, so they were the first to discuss this and really noted that in the severity of increased partial pressure, that the symptoms and the the uh, effects were largely reversible and that the toxic effects of oxygen at partial pressures between 0.45 and 1.6 were primarily in the lungs and the toxic effect of partial pressure over 1.6 were primarily in the brain. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. So oxygen uh, toxicity, signs and symptoms. The earliest signs and symptoms of pulmonary or lung oxygen toxicity is a mild irritation in, in the throat. And it's made worse by deep breathing. A mild yeah. cough develops next and followed by more severe irritation and cough until breathing becomes really painful and the cough becomes uncontrollable. Now, if exposure to the oxygen is continued, the person is going to notice a tightness in the chest, difficulty breathing, and shortness of breath. And if the exposure is continued long enough, the person actually dies from lack of oxygen. The progressive yeah. damage to the lungs eventually makes it impossible for the oxygen to get into the and pass the hemoglobin barrier as mm -hmm. it passes through into the lungs. So the yeah. person actually starves to death of oxygen. Now, out of curiosity, is because some of those symptoms you were talking about on our on our altitude diving class about the gentleman that um, they were on this dive and he had high blood pressure. Sure, and that's emergent pulmonary edema. Sure. Yeah, they went down to that that you know deeper depth, and he basically was starving of air. Uh, some of the symptoms that I recall was that he had irritation that he had talked about having irritation of the throat and had coughing, Un uncontrollable coughing. Sure. Yeah. But now you remember, think about when the symptoms prop. They started, his symptoms started to develop before the dive and immediately into the dive. Now, yeah. here's where it gets interesting. With the onset of symptoms of pulmonary oxygen toxicity, mm -hmm. most individuals can tolerate 12 to 16 hours of oxygen at 100%, 8 to 14 hours at 150%, and 3 to 6 hours at 200% before some symptoms start to develop. Yeah. So as we start thinking about seeing symptoms, we start thinking about when did we say symptoms and what pre preceded that symptom? A long dive, a three hour dive in a cave on uh, at 1.4? Yeah, that, that would absolutely make sense. And it certainly, um, with coughing and, and tightness in the chest, certainly could be pulmonary oxygen toxicity or could be immersion pulmonary edema. But there's also other symptoms we talked about with IPO in, for example, that unable to catch their breath and um, having signs and symptoms like um, saying that they were out of gas even when they had a full tank. Yeah. So we start looking at all the, the bigger pictures. We look at that as well. Yeah. I just was wondering if they were related slightly. Nope. So, um, okay. pul Immersion pulmonary edema actually causes the lungs to, in essence, sweat and start developing liquid inside. Pulmonary yeah. um, oxygen toxicity, pulmonary oxygen toxicity actually um, doesn't add liquid into the lungs, but causes the lungs to stop being able to pass oxygen through. Okay. So it's almost like it's, um, it's almost like the tissues have been scorched to a degree on a cellular right level. Away. Yep. But they just more, more so overwhelmed, right? There's always so much water you can drink in two seconds. Same thing. It, it gets to the point where it literally overwhelms the sieve and they're not able, to, it's not able to allow anymore because it's just blocked. You know, it's, it's blocked plumbing is a better way to think about it. Okay, that makes sense. And that also would prevent the exchange of carbon dioxide uh, as well because if you have too much good, oxygen. Yeah. yeah, so I'm just thinking about it on a, on a microcellular level. Sorry. Sure, absolutely. So as we start talking about uh, pulmonary oxygen toxicity, there's several ways to track the developing of pulmonary oxygen toxicity, but the most sensitive and most accurate way is the development of symptoms. Yeah. Now, the second way is to do a vital capacity check. And one of the things that 
I have a severe disagreement with with most divers when they go to get their um, uh, their physical for professional or recreational diving is they go to their GP physician who doesn't know uh, crap all uh, about diving. And it's extremely rare to get a vital capacity test before diving as well. And it's one of the things that most divers should have to make sure that their lungs are fit for diving. While the, yeah. the doctor can certainly listen to breath sounds and, and heart rate, shouldn't he test the, the ability to push and suck in oxygen? Yeah, makes a lot so, of sense. Absolutely. Now, the good news is with this, uh, the mild effects are complete, in mild cases, are completely reversible and no permanent lung damage usually occurs. However, damage will take two to four weeks to heal if you get into oxygen uh, pulmonary toxicity. Yeah. Now, if we start moving up the chain and we start getting into central nervous system toxicity, uh, we've got a neat little acronym for that. And it's called CONVENTED. So as we look at this, CONVENTED means convulsions like grand mal seizures, vision, tunnel vision, or other changes in your ear, in your eyes, um, ears ringing, um, nausea, twitching, irritability, um, and dizziness. Now, usually the twitching is, is most commonly in the face as well. No. Now, as we kind of think about this, I always think about yourself and your dive buddy. And so I like to think about, as you think about these, which signs would you notice in somebody else and which signs could you only notice in yourself? Um, Probably the nausea, uh, the twitching. You can see the twitching on somebody else's face. Ears ringing uh, and vision uh, distortions. Those would be the ones. Um, so... Uh, dizziness, uh, ears ringing, and, and visual distortions. Absolutely. Would, so here's right. how I like to put it, is that in diving, uh, it's key to realize that this is a, a very, very self-aware sport. How you feel going in the water is how you should feel coming out of the water. Yeah. So if you notice something different, all of a sudden, my ears are ringing when they weren't before. I was feeling sick, uh, twitching, or I'm having trouble walking. Um, it's definitely time to be aware that something may not be right. Fair enough? Yeah. So, Justin, I, I kind of skipped over the nitrocosis because I think we got it, and and it's it's not a real prevalent worry in uh, nitrox diving. But as you dive deeper, the narcotic effect of nitrogen gets... It gets greater. Absolutely. Um, which of the following is not a symptom of decompression sickness? Uh Weakness, extreme. Uh, excuse my dyslexia. Um, Can you just please read those off to me, please? <laughs> Extreme fatigue, cyanosis, like bluish skin color, or tingling or numbing of the extremities. Which of them is not some? Mm -hmm. Which of them is not... Um, Which of them is not the uh, symptom of decompression sickness? What? Pardon me for that. Um, oh, you can have weakness with decompression sickness. Extreme fatigue. Uh, tingling or numbness that is a sign of decompression sickness bluing uh would be a sign of low oxygen i'm gonna go with i might be wrong but i'm gonna go with the uh cyanosis correct um so that'd be um hypoxia or um 
getting cold, hypothermia, right? Yeah. So uh, even if the diver suffers decompression sickness in a remote location, you should never transport the diver to a treatment facility, even if it involves uh, considerable delay, provide oxygen and first aid and watch vital signs, provide water to drink, or recompress the diver underwater. Never recompress the diver underwater. Absolutely. You're just asking for more problems. Now, the key to this is, is if the diver suffers from decompression sickness is kind of the, the key point here. Um, the only way we know they're getting, they have decompression sickness um, is if they start presenting symptoms. Yeah. So I need to just, I, I like to point that out. All right. Hypoxic hypoxia is by far the most foreign, common form of hypoxia. And it's fun to say. Um, this condition is where the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood is low, where the partial pressure of nitrogen in the arterial blood is low, where the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial uh, blood is too high, and where the partial pressure of nitrogen in the arterial blood is too high. And uh, what did you say the word was? Hypoxia? Hypoxic hypoxia. So when you become hypoxic, hypoxia. Hypoxic hypoxia. Yep. Not hyper, but hypo. Yeah. yeah. Um, oxygen is too high. Nitrogen is too low or too high. Hi hypercapnia is where your blood is carbon huh? dioxide. Hypercapnia is carbon dioxide. Yeah, no. that's carbon dioxide. I'm gonna go ahead and say it's. I'm gonna go ahead and say that it is blood oxygen is too low. That's correct. You're hypoxic if you have, don't have enough oxygen. Gotcha. All right. When oxygen pressure in the body drops below partial pressure of 0.17. Mild symptom of hypoxia occur, but blackout and death may occur if the partial pressure of oxygen drops below. Uh, if it drops below. Read that off to me again. I'm sorry. That's fine. Blackout and death may occur if the partial pressure of oxygen drops below. Uh, that's the uh, 0 0.1. That's correct. And finally, a possible source of contaminated air in a scuba cylinder is improperly located intake or air compressor, improperly maintained air compressor, oil vapors in the air compressor, or all answers. All of them. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Good job. So as we kind of go through this process, we talk a little bit about decompression theory, and, and I'd like to talk just briefly on this. And we, we talked about Paul Burt uh, just briefly for a second um, with... Uh, um, J. Lorraine Smith, and uh, they both contributed to J.S. Haldane. And how J.S. Haldane came up with the basic idea that something bad was happening to the divers. And he started studying, and he started studying what was happening with oxygen, with nitrogen, and everything else. And what he determined as he's working for the British Admiralty back in uh, 1900 was that when the partial pressure of the gas became a two to one, or when the gas became a two to one pressure, um, that bad things happened. That's all uh, what he came up with. And is that when we get to two, one full atmosphere below that something bad was happening, it was causing um, DCS, um, the bends basically. And he realized that he needed to do something. Well, the thing about it is he was close. He was on the right track. Um, and uh, in later in the 1950s, uh, we had uh, Robert Workman came along. He says, Haldine, you were really close. But what you need to do is look a little bit deeper into this. And what you would discover is there's multiple gases within the gas that we're breathing. And you can't just say two to one ratio. So what he said is that yeah. he came up with workman's critical difference. And workman's critical difference basically said with the partial pressure of nitrogen got to a double that of the surface atmospheric pressure, 
that we could develop the signs and symptoms of DCS if we didn't decompress properly. That's all no. he's really saying. Robert Workman was a, um, a captain in the U.S. Coast Guard. Well, the thing about it is, interestingly enough, he was later proven wrong. And uh, we had Robert Buhlman came along, and he was funded by Shell Oil. And he said, you guys are close. And uh, I'm going to take this idea of tissue compartments, and I'm going to put it on his ear. And we went back to Haldanian math, um, and we determined how the, how they was correct. His algorithms that he built to come up with his ideas were right on the money. And so Robert, uh, Albert Bullman, Buhlman uh, came along and he said, okay, I theorize that there are 12 tissue compartments that have different half times. Um, and it takes different amounts of time for each tissue compartment to saturate from. And he termed them fast tissue to slow tissue. Well, as he continued yep. his research, he ended up coming up with 16 uh, tissue compartments and then refining his algorithm to where it's at currently at the 16C version of that yeah. algorithm, which he uh, which was finally published in 1996. And that's the basis with what we all use today is uh, Buhlman ZH16C. Yeah. Okay, so that's what we're using. And it's interesting. It's all All of his research is based on Haldanian math, which is from the 1900s. Um, so that's kind of what we came up with. The idea is that um, as the tissue compartments become saturated, um, that they have to desaturate as they come along. And that tissue, different tissue compartments absorb tissue, uh, absorb nitrogen at different speeds. So, for example, a fast tissue like your brainstem would have a very short half time to be able to absorb nitrogen. It would do it very, very quickly. Whereas a slow tissue like fat or, or bone would take a lot longer to fully absorb. And so based upon those that algorithm to figure out how long a tissue target takes to absorb a gas, we're able to come up with a basic algorithm that says, here's what's happening. Now, now as we kind of continue down that path to understand, we now understand that there's bubbles coming out of those tissue compartments and they have to go through the venous system into the chest, into our alveolar, and they're eventually exhaled, right? That that uh, partial pressure of nitrogen and the carbon dioxide. So that's basically happening. And we start, we're able to build up some basic ideas from that. Um, so as we were as saturating. So that's why we have something called the safety stop. Yeah. The, the safety stop, and the, I've got an interesting chart on this, is basically a point where we stop at 15 to 20 feet, and we're going to talk a lot more in depth about that. And we, we allow the nitrogen in our body to defuse from the tissue compartments, go into the venous system, and be exhaled. We give that it, while we're under pressure to do that. We generally do it, you know, 15, 20 feet for three to five minutes. But the interesting thing is, is we have a new term for you. It's called the M value. And the M value basically is the point at which a tissue compartment is 100% saturated. That as I begin to ascend in the water column, that tissue compartment becomes over super saturated and has to let the gas off. So I need to allow the gas to come up, come out of that tissue compartment very slowly. Think uh, back to the idea of the of a bottle of Coke uh, with a top on it. If I shake the crap out of it and I let yeah. the top off real too way too quickly, crap bubbles go everywhere. But if I let it off very slowly, my white shirt is safe. Yeah. That's that's basically what M value is. It's the maximum amount of, of um, gas a tissue compartment can hold before it has to go to super saturation. The only way it can go to super saturation is on an ascent. So as we look at this, the idea is, is there's an M value line and then there's a safety margin in our actual profile. So simply enough, as we start rising the water column, we start with bubble seeds, which are down here. They move yeah. into silent bubbles and then eventually become symptomatic bubbles. And what we know is if we do less deco in a faster ascent, we move up to the point where those bubbles get bigger and bigger and bigger. So less deco and faster ascents mean larger bubbles more, and also mean more risk. But if we slow our ascents down and we spend more time at a safety stop, um, it means more deco and creates less risk and thus less symptoms because the bubbles are too small to cause problems. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. Justin, I want you to take uh, just a couple of things away from this. Dive tables and safety stops are how divers manage the size of the bubbles in their bloodstreams. Yep. Fair enough. 
Nope. Safety stops assist in the reduction of the size of those bubbles. There's no clear line between good and bad, as we kind of saw. It was kind of a gray zone. And here's the bad news, Justin, is how you dissolve nitrogen and uh, diffuse nitrogen in your system is much different than how I do it. Yeah. Here's where it gets worse, Justin, is how you dissolve that nitrogen today is very different than how you'll dissolve nitrogen tomorrow. Yeah. So day to day, it changes. It changes on how well you're rested. It changes on how... Um, how you feel and how much sleep you got, um, whether you had a fight with the wife the night before. There's so many factors involved with how those bubbles are going to um, dissolve in your system. The now, amount of adrenaline you have in your system, uh, the temperature of the water you're diving in, the activity you had the day before, the activity that you participate in immediately after a dive. Yeah. You bet. So one of the things I like about the new Garmin, so I, I dive the Mark III. Um, and, uh, it gives you a dive readiness score. And so my dive readiness score right now is low. So that's kind of my sanity check. And it's, it tells me, um, uh, that, uh, focus on energy levels, um, uh, be careful, bad things could happen. And that, and the nice thing is, is as it's, it's, uh, looking at the factors, my sleep was good, but Mark, I'm not fully recovered or fully recovered. My body battery is low. My sleep history was fair. Um, it goes through all the different things. So it's kind of nice to, to look at that. But as you realize, it, if this is taken into an account, it takes into hydration, rest, exercise, uh, sleep, um, how much I've worked out, worked during the day, what my pulse ox was during the day. And every day that, day, that number is different and it's arrived at a different factor. So just be aware that that number can change and you got to be very, very careful. That's where the quote unquote undeserved uh uh, deco hit can uh, can come from you might have dove that same dive a dozen times and never had a problem and you you use the same profile but because circumstances your biological circumstances are different that day uh, you didn't properly off gas on your, on your attempt. so there's a couple of factors that you can you can do Justin that will help prevent DCS and we're going to get into one, an important one here in a moment. But the first one is, is making sure I'm ready for the dive. And that's going to be well rested, um, well hydrated. If we think about it, the blood system, our blood is like a conveyor belt. It processes stuff into our body and it processes stuff out of our body. The way we lubricate that so that it doesn't slow down is we make sure that we're well hydrated. Well hydrated blood is nice and thin and it transports very easily. Another thing we can do, Justin, it's very simple. We can make sure we stay warm before, during, and especially after the dive. Um, yeah. At the safety stop and beyond, it's incredibly important to stay warm. I always encourage, whether you're in the in the Caribbean or not, to always make sure you wear a wetsuit. Uh, hyperthermia is cumulative, and it will build up on you whether you realize, realize it or not. So staying warm is a huge factor. It actually reduces your chances of DCS by a factor of three to four, mm -hmm. just by staying warm. Hydration being another one. But Justin, there's another huge one that you can do that will reduce your chance of DCS by a factor of 10. You know what that is? Exercise before the dive. Absolutely. The day before the dive, more importantly. Yeah. Now, actually enough, in, in exercising the day before the dive, 19 hours being the optimal time, a 20 to 25 minute aerobic, not anaerobic, but aerobic workout reduces your chances by about a factor of 10 of getting DCS. And the interesting reason is the reason. It's not that you're oxygenating the cells or you're getting healthier, you're oxygenating, cleaning out, it, any of that kind of stuff. What ends up happening as you exercise, the body releases an enzyme into the venous system that literally coats the venous system. And as it coats the venous system, as the bubbles come through, they don't have anything to catch on. Because if bubbles are able to grab onto something and catch, another bubble will crash into it and they'll perfuse together, making a bigger bubble. Yeah. So it's interesting to kind of think about that. And the last thing we can do to help avoid getting DCS is making sure we do a safety stop. Now, Justin, I want to tell you the tale of three different divers. Diver number one, uh, all, all three divers did the same dive, by the way. They did a 25-minute dive to 120 feet. Diver number one was a bad little piggy, and he decided to do a direct ascent to the surface, no safety stop. And he's in blue. And so what we found is at the 17-minute mark after he came out of the water, he was at 119,000 bubbles per cubic liter. That's a lot. 
At the 30 minute mark, he was down to 60,000. At the 60 minute mark, um, he was down to 25,000. And at the 120, two hours later, he was finally down to 19,000 bubbles per cubic liter. Now, uh, second little piggy did the same dive, but he stopped for two minutes at three at uh, 10 feet. Now, yep. what we discovered is he was substantially lower, but at the 15-minute mark, he was at uh, 19,000 bubbles per cubic liter, decreasing eventually to 7,000 bubbles per cubic liter. Now, piggy number three was our best diver. He stopped at um, 20 feet for one minute and at 10 feet for four minutes. What we find is he was the only one that had a decrease in nitrogen at the 15-minute mark and went down to about 6,000 bubbles per cubic liter. And at the 42 minute mark, had zero bubbles per cubic liter. Wow. Just by doing a total of a five minute safety stop. Justin, here's what I'd like you to take away from that. Safety stops reduce bubbles. A longer safety stop reduces more bubbles than a shorter one. And a five minute safety stop, stop, safety stop during repetitive dives increases your safety margin substantially. Justin, do a safety stop. Oh yeah. Easy enough. Uh, and do a longer one. Don't be afraid to take your time. I promise you that time spent in the water is better than anything else you're going to do during the day. Now, let's jump into a little bit of dive computers here. Justin, so dive computers, uh, the first dive computers uh, were theorized in the 60s by the U.S. Navy because they realized that they had problems and they wanted to be able to maximize the amount of time divers could spend down doing tactical things for the Navy, but they wanted to be able to figure out how long that would so they would stay safe. Now, their intended use was for the Navy. It was designed, um, but at that time, they weren't able to have the computing power to build them. So the first dive computers really came around in the 70s, and they were really considered top secret and classified. Their intended use was for the Navy. Um, overall, their limitations, Justin, um, overall, even today's dive computers have some very key uh, um, significant uh, limitations to them. You know what they are? Um, go ahead. Go ahead and tell me. They're not biometric. So Justin, my dive computer on your wrist will give you the same readings as it was, as if it was on my wrist. Yeah. If we do the exact same dive, it'll spit out the same amount of numbers. So they're not designed to be specific to the individual diver. So again, be aware that you need to uh, be aware of what you need to, what your dive is like. If you're tired and you're still diving, then you need to do a more conservative dive. The dive computers certainly are based on the lowest common denominator, but uh, if you are the lowest common denominator, you'll be right next to the edge and you certainly could take an undeserved DCS hit. So be aware. It's definitely something to, to be aware of. But the benefit to diving is that they're designed for multi-level diving. In if you were to do a dive plan based upon the dive tables, it would say I dropped directly to X depth, stated that exact depth for that time, and I did a direct ascent. Now, the good news is, is the dive computer is designed to give you credit for time not spent at that depth. So if you do a gradual descent, it's going to give you uh, credit for the time you weren't at the depth. And as you start mm -hmm. to ascend and you're not at that depth, it's going to give you uh, credit for the time not spent at that depth. So you get longer dives because it's more algorithmically correct. It also is able to more accurately um, give you a residual nitrogen factor based upon your service interval and your next dive as well. And then most dive computers will also give you the benefit of um, being able to correct for altitude as well, which you've already gone through. Now they, other do, they don't do a lot of the cool things as well. For example, this is a Sunto Core. Um, it's a great recreational basic computer. Um, but as you look at it, it's also could do air integrations, tell you how much gas is in your, in your tank, um, your current depth, my ascent rate, my dive time, and how much time I have left on this dive. So I don't have to think very much at all, which is wonderful. I actually um, talked to a uh, dive manufacturer, uh, computer dive uh, manufacturer today, and they actually added color um, gradient or color scales to their pods. And so on their, uh, with their computers, when, if you're at, um, 1,500 PSI to 3,000 PSI or more, their pod glows green. If you're at 500 PSI to 1,500 PSI, their pod glows, glows yellow. And if you're below 500 PSI, their pod glows red. So there's all kinds of cool things that they can do for you. It's really neat. And it's definitely, definitely, definitely encouraged, right, to make sure that you're you're using a good dive computer. There's a lot now, of good ones out there. 
Well, are you talking about the actual pod of the uh, dive computer uh, 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 display, or are you talking about the pod that's on your tank? The pod that's on your tank. Oh, cool. So that means your dive buddy can see that where your air is. Exactly. Or if you're your diving side mount, you can see it as well. So yeah. it, absolutely. Or your instructor. So it, definitely a very cool feature that I hadn't seen before. Um, and definitely a, a really cool way to go. So um, there's a lot of cool things. Um, and when you're ready for a dive computer, Justin, let me know. Um, and I'd be happy to make some strong recommendations for you as and uh, get you into the correct dive computer. Um, at Idaho Dive Pirates, they, they sell um, several really great computers and, and happy to assist with that as well. I've kind of been looking at the uh, Tarek, uh, the air integrated uh, uh, Tarek from, from uh, Surewater. But uh, um, if it were me, I would move up to the Garmin Mark III and I'd be happy to send you a link on it. Um, in terms of uh, functionality, it has every bit of functionality um, of the Tarek, but the surface skill uh, features of it are substantially better. Okay, so so you're talking about when you're when you're not in the dive, it's monitoring, like you said, it's it's monitoring sleep patterns and heart rate and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Um, it has the most superior features of a surface-based computer uh, out there. And even neater is if you dive it where it can touch your skin, it'll mm -hmm. it'll monitor your heart rate during your dive as well. Or you can get a, my wife and I have heart rate uh, monitor straps that we wear under our dry suits. Okay. So that's, the that's amount really of, cool. plus it also has data features and it connects into your uh, phone, your iPhone as well, or your, your Droid, whatever you have. But it'll give you a lot. It has just a lot more features. So if you're looking at a, a watch-based computer, I would I recommend the Mark III, Mark II or Mark III. I've I've got a Mark II as well, and 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 a Mark III. So okay, aren't they a little bit better? Aren't they a little bit better with their Sonic uh, interface with the with the pod? Aren't they a little bit better as well about being able to to uh, maintain sure. communication? They do. I, I have less communication issues. I didn't have that many. I don't have any communication with my. I have Shearwaters as well. I don't have any communication. But one of the cool things that you can do uh, if you have the Mark III and a T2 pod is you can actually talk to other divers whilst you're underwater. They they'll send messages back and forth. Oh, okay. And so. then my person. This is my personal favorite feature. <laughs> it has a very, as you can see, a very bright light. Yeah. I, on, I, cur on. I curious. I out. Yeah, now, now, yeah. There you go. Now it's not coming off. Um, it, it always when you're trying to show off, right? <laughs> Let's see. One, two, three. Oh, there we go. I just wouldn't hit it right. So you have to hit one, two, three. <laughs> Looks like you're having my problems. There it goes. I can, yeah. and it also has a help feature as well. So if if you push and hold it um, while you're dive uh, during a dive, it'll start flashing SOS as well. But it's a bright little light. It's pretty neat. Um, I really believe firmly in the, the if you're going to do a wrist based computer, the Mark II or Mark III are probably the best two on the market by far. If you're going to do a console computer, um, the uh, Apex DSX, uh, the Shearwater Perdix II. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, are both fantastic computers. So um, when you're ready to buy one, let me know. Um, I, I uh, The Dive Pirates can certainly do it, or Stuart Scuba can help you out as well. So I, I can get you taken care of either way. I will absolutely go ahead and give you a shout. I'll get um, you taken care of. Yeah. All right. Let's just continue our, our cavalcade of values here. Let's see. As we go through this process, one of the most important parts of this is Justin – when it comes to my wife picking up nitrox tanks, how much do you think she trusts me to analyze her tanks? Uh, you always check you always check the stench yourself on the horse you're going to ride. So I would say she probably doesn't trust anybody to not make a mistake. She does not. Fun story for you. So Nick and I uh, went to Florida for uh, two weeks uh, um, about a year ago, and. Uh, there was a hurricane. We were luckily we were cave diving the whole week, um, and we wanted to go over and we wanted to do just some recreational ocean dives whilst we were there. 
And um, it was a couple days after the hurricane. We had to drive an hour south of where we were at. We finally found a boat that was going out. It was just a recreational 60 foot boat. And we're like, okay, cool. We're going to see pretty fish and reefs. That's we've been looking, we've been diving caves all week. We want to do something different. So it was great. Yeah. So we, um, I uh, called them up, made reservations, paid over the phone and, and ordered nitrox for us. And I, if I'm going to dive, I dive nitrox in the ocean. It's just how we are. And yeah. so we get there and they're loading up our tanks. And I said, Hey, wait, before you put that tank on, I need to analyze the tank. And the guy looked at me like I was crazy. And he, <laughs> he said, uh, I analyzed it already. I says, that's great, but I need to analyze it. He looked at me and says, but I'm a retired firefighter. Don't you trust me? I says, not no. for nothing, dude, but I bet you about a minute and a half ago, thank you for your service, but I need to analyze my tank. He says, but I analyzed it already. I says, that's great. I need to analyze my tank. He says, but I'm a retired firefighter. I says, thank you for your service. I still need to analyze my tank. And begrudgingly, let me analyze my tank. So always, always, always analyze your tank. Make sure you have those charts handy. And it's simple. Um, the first thing you want to do is you want to neutralize or calibrate your analyzer. And the easiest way to do that is one of two ways, either uh, on a known tank or turn it on, let it clear and um, analyze it to the ambient pressure of what you're at. The yeah. better way to do it is on a known gas. So if you have a tank of air, analyze it on that first, get it to the 21% and then analyze it on your tank. The easiest way to do this is once you have it calibrated to the 21%, you, you turn it on, you get it to uh, neutralize out to 21%, you put it, um, the, the nipple over the end of the tank and you gently, turn, gently, gently, mm -hmm. gently turn that tank on just so you get to the point where it goes, yeah, not just, and you hold the nipple over the end of the tank until the numbers stop moving or they move very little. That final number that you look at will be your nitrox blend. Yeah. Now, there's other ways to do this. And so for example, with the palm air, you can actually hook into the inflator hose. Um, and there's also ones that screw over. Make sure that the dive shop that you're at shows you how to use their analyzer because there's about 15 to 20 different analyzers out there. Um, I personally use a Nubo Air Stick. It's about 300 bucks. I own my own. And I take it with me usually. So making sure you have your own. Now, be aware, any cylinders you use is going to have to be oxygen and clean. And the reason being is that um, once it's oxygen clean, it's able to take um, nitrox in it and it has less risk of explosion or fire. Yeah. So it's yeah. cleaning out uh, everything that doesn't need to be there basically, right? Um, yeah. So one of the other things to be aware of as well is make sure you check your gear to make sure that it fits rule 40. And most scuba gear does. Rule 40 basically says that all gear is designed to use up to 40% nitrox. Now, today, you're being certified for up to what percentage of nitrox? Uh, 32 and 40. 40%. Do you think that 40% is a coincidence that you're only being certified to 40%? No. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Because most gear is set up for 40% as we go through this. Now, uh, as you look at this, uh, at your tank... One of the things you're going to notice is that an auction clean tank will have a couple things on it. It's going to have a visual inspector on it, and it's going to be checked off that it's been O2 clean. Yeah. They, they, now, O2 clean is a pretty straightforward process. What we do is we take the, the uh, cap off uh, or the valve off. We go ahead and ru uh, run some cleaner in it, and we run rocks in it and roll it till it's clean. And then we clean it out really well to clean out the hydrocarbons. The problem is, is hydrocarbons under pressure that interact with pure oxygen can cause an explosion or fire. So we try and make sure we don't do that. Fire and explosion are generally bad in scuba um, yep. and not things we want to deal with. So we want to make sure that our tank is oxygen clean. And then the tank should be marked with some sort of green and yellow sticker. Um, it may say nitrox. It may say geyser gas. It may say something of that nature, but it'll be marked very clearly as well. Um, and make sure that all that is intact. Now, Here's one thing I hate is they show putting a tag over this. Please don't put a tag over your, your this because how well is that going to last in the water? It's just going to pollute the water um, exactly. when, when it rots off. So please take a small piece of duct tape and a marker and on your tank, once you've analyzed it, put the PPO2 of what it is. In this case, 32%. Pull up your chart and write down what the mod is at what, par, uh, what partial pressure, 1.4 when you did it and your a name, sign it. Now, here's what I go a little different is not only do I put this 
right at on duct tape right here. But I also put a big piece of duct tape at the bottom of the tank right here. If you can see my, my cursor yep. on both sides, front and back with the same information with my maximum operating depth on it and very clear in what, um, and I do, in this case, I'd put 109 FT for feet so that people know my unit measure. Now, Justin, I go one step farther. I also put the same thing on the bottom of the tank. I want mm -hmm. this to be very clear. Now, this could be my tech um, my tech instructor coming out at me, but I do it even on recreational tanks. And the nice thing is, if I put the, a big number on the back and the bottom of the tank, and it says 109 feet, and I'm at 120 feet, and somebody's behind me, they should be able to see my maximum operating depth at a say 109 and they should be able to say, wait a minute, we're at 120. So they should be able to come over tap me on the shoulder and say, Hey, dumbass, go ahead and head uh, shallower because you're way deeper than you should be. You're not paying attention. So I yep. like to make sure that I add my an additional level of safety that people can look at and see and say, Hey, wait a minute, you're too deep. And so I make this nice and simple and easy. Make sense. Makes a lot of sense. So mark your tanks. Well, just that way, that way your buddy can know what you're what you're set up for. Exactly. You shouldn't have to remember it. Perfect. Justin, what questions do you have? Oh. I think we've covered it covered it pretty well. Absolutely. Um, have you done your homework? Yes, I have. I've Fantastic. completed all the homework. I've completed Perfect. all the homework and I've gone through the uh the uh, two-part final exams, both of them. Fantastic. And that makes things a lot easier. Well, perfect, Justin. Well, if you don't have any questions, we'll leave it there. I'll end the recording. Okay.